don't have any facts. They don't have any evidence against us. Millions and millions of pages, years of litigation, and all politically motivated. Breaking news out of Los Angeles, where Hunter Biden has just pleaded not guilty to federal tax charges. Florida is where it's at because of Governor DeSantis and his policies. And as your president, he will take that same hard work ethic. Hello, everyone. I'm Weijia Jiang in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. We are following developments in two major legal cases on both coasts. In New York City, former President Donald Trump attended closing arguments in his civil fraud trial. And in Los Angeles, Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to nine federal tax charges. Both cases could have serious implications for the 2024 presidential election. Robert Costa and Erica Brown joins us now. Robert is CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent. And Erica is a CBS News investigative reporter right outside that courthouse in Los Angeles. But I want to start with Robert in New York City to talk about the Trump civil fraud trial. Uh, Robert, we heard from the pre former president today. He was there. What can you tell us about what happened? Uh, former President Trump appeared in court today for the closing arguments in his ongoing New York civil fraud case. I was inside the courthouse behind me, and I watched as Trump listened for much of the day, then ultimately proceeded to speak, sometimes veering outside of the bounds of what the judge in this case, Arthur and Gorin, wanted to be said in the courtroom. And then Trump left. He went down the street to his building at 40 Wall Street. I was there, had a few exchanges with former President Trump about how he sees all of this. He told me that he uh, sees the campaign as something that's part of his own legal challenges, and his legal challenges as part of the campaign. He doesn't separate the two. And he also told me in CBS News that in the coming months, as he faces not only a trial here and down the street for his hush money payments to a porn star and a defamation case here in New York, he also plans to attend all of his trial dates in Washington and in Florida for those federal cases, one on classified records, the other, of course, on January 6th. And Robert, Trump has made very clear that he believes he is innocent. I want to play a little bit of what he had to say today. We've proven this case so conclusively. Uh, we've asked for directed verdict many times. Uh, they don't have any facts. They don't have any evidence against us. Millions and millions of pages, years of litigation, and all politically motivated. Of course, Robert, that's not up to him whether to decide whether he's innocent or not. So can you talk to us about what's at stake in this case for President Trump if he is found guilty? If he is, well, he's, it's, this is not a, a criminal case, so it's not about being found guilty. At this point, he's already been found liable for fraud. Uh, the judge in this case, Arthur and Gorin, has said that he believes and has concluded legally that Trump, his two sons, and his businesses have defrauded banks and companies with the valuation of their properties over recent decades. And because of that, he's already concluded Trump will be liable for some penalty. What this civil fraud trial is all about, and these closing arguments are all about, is what's the scope of the penalty going to be? And for now, it could be a pretty severe penalty from the judge in this case. He could decide, as he has signaled he might possibly do, ban Trump from doing business in New York, which would be quite a position for him to take. The Trump Organization goes back decades, going back to Trump's father, Fred Trump, who built all those apartments in the outer boroughs, ultimately the buildings here in Manhattan by his son, Donald Trump. And for Trump to not be able to build in Manhattan, build in in Brooklyn or the Bronx anymore would be such a, a difference for Trump, something he hasn't ever really had to deal with as a businessman, even though he has faced enormous legal headaches before. And he could have a penalty of about 200 to 300 million dollars leveled against him and his company should the judge decide to move in that direction. Robert, thank you for clarifying that. And you're right, that would be part of his brand that he would no longer be able to tap into. Thank you for your reporting. And to discuss Hunter Biden's arraignment, CBS News investigative reporter Erica Brown joins us now. She was inside the courtroom earlier. Erica, what can you tell us about uh, the charges that Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to today? Yeah, so in a 56-page indictment, federal prosecutors charged Hunter Biden uh, with nine federal tax charges that included six misdemeanors and three felony counts related to his alleged failure to file and pay taxes, tax evasion, and filing 
a false tax return. And so federal prosecutors in the indictment alleged that Hunter Biden earned uh, $7 million in income and, and, and found a way not to pay more than $1 million in federal income tax. And they said that there were a number of personal expenses, including luxury hotel stays, luxury rentals, exotic cars uh, that were built as business deductions, and that ultimately lowered his taxable income. And so in this 56-page indictment, they detail with uh, numbers, numbers, they detail with records from his accountant. They also reference portions of his memoir uh, in which he talks about not doing business. He talks about being under the influence of, of drugs and some of his expenditures. And they cross-reference that with the years for the tax returns that he allegedly filed fraudulently. And so he's facing these nine federal tax counts. If convicted, he could face up to 17 years in prison. So, Erica, what is the strategy here then for his uh, defense? Because 17 years is a long time that he could face as a maximum punishment. That's right. And to kind of get a clue as to where the defense might go with this, we can take a look at what's happening in the District of Delaware, where Hunter Biden is currently facing three felony gun charges. He pleaded not guilty to those charges in October. And his defense attorneys filed a motion to dismiss, saying that a plea agreement that ultimately unraveled in court last summer was still legally binding. Now, that a plea agreement included two misdemeanor tax charges uh, and also gun charges. And they said that that's legally binding. And so we may see a similar filing here in California. The outcome will be different. We're in two different jurisdictions. But just to give us a clue as to what their legal strategy is, they may point to that plea agreement that ultimately unraveled that they claim is still legally binding. Well, in that plea agreement, Erica Brown, um, the charges for the guns and the taxes were all lumped together in uh, a deal that ultimately fell apart. But I wonder now um, whether these two separate cases could have any impact on each other. Yeah, well, we'll we're waiting to see uh, what happens. I think when we look at how the deal unraveled, one of the things that the judge, uh, who did not ultimately accept that plea, pointed to was whether or not these, this agreement would uh, shield Hunter Biden from any uh, future charges, would shield him from any jail time. And federal prosecutors and Hunter Biden's attorneys could not agree, and so that federal judge did not accept it. And so they're in two very separate jurisdictions. That plea agreement only included two misdemeanor tax charges. Here in the Central District of California, he's facing nine tax charges, six misdemeanors, and three felonies. So it'll be interesting to see how his defense attorney, if they do use that argument that the plea agreement is still valid, how they then account for the seven other charges uh, that he's currently facing. And Erica, since we were not able to be inside and you were, tell us a little bit about Hunter Biden's demeanor today. What did you see on his face? So Hunter Biden appeared very relaxed and calm. He was speaking to his attorneys frequently before the hearing was underway. During the hearing, he was attentive. He was taking notes. Uh, when the district judge, Mark Scarcy, asked him if he was aware of his rights, he said yes. When he asked him if he was aware of the charges against him, he said yes. When asked to enter his, uh, his plea, Hunter Biden stood up and said not guilty. Uh, so my, from my perspective, he appeared confident. He appeared calm, frequently conversing with, with his attorneys. We even saw him smile a couple of times in speaking with his attorney. And so he did not seem flustered at all. Obviously, we don't know what's going on in his mind. Uh, but on the outward, he appeared to be calm and in control. Erica Brown, thank you for all of your reporting today. Congress has just over a week to avert a government shutdown. We go to Capitol Hill next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Congress has until a week from tomorrow to pass legislation that would avert a government shutdown. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Speaker Mike Johnson appeared to have a spending agreement in place, but now hardline Republicans are pushing for a new deal. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland joins us now. Scott, what do they want? Oh, we're not watching a political movie. We're watching a political sequel. This feels familiar. It's because we went through this in late 2023. We have another deadline, another pair of deadlines to avoid a government shutdown. One of them is next Friday. One of them is the first week of February. They're going to cut it close again. 
and they may need to, and there seems to be an increasing sense here tonight, they will do a continuing resolution, one of those brief deals just to push the deadline down the road so they can keep negotiating. Ultimately, the U.S. House Speaker has to find a way to corral enough votes to get this through the House. He's already cut a deal with the Senate on how much to spend, but between now and then, they have to figure out what to spend it on. And in the meantime, about a dozen of the farther right members of his House Republican conference say they don't like this deal. They may try to blow it up. They're asking the speaker to go back to the drawing board. That would cause time, and potentially cause a shutdown. But even the brinksmanship, Legion, can be impactful, can cause pain. We brought that question to members of Congress from both parties late today. Take a listen to what they had to tell us. This is what uh, a, a democracy and a Congress looks like when there are many people with different backgrounds. Our constituents want us fighting for them. And so to accept that means that at times we're not going to get to the finish line as quickly as we want. However, we've got to get to the finish line. If you're attempting to sign up for things like Social Security disability, if you're attempting to enroll in Medicare, um, things like that will be delayed. And then, of course, it's not just federal government workers. Our military wouldn't get paid. We have, obviously, a, an important situation at the southern border. All of our CBP officers would be working unpaid. How do you think they would feel? Would they show up? So there are, are a number of ramifications, both large and small, when we face a government shutdown. Through the day today, Ouija, there was like this revolving door of members of the House Republican Conference going into the Speaker of the House's office, trying to get some commitments from him to change or alter whatever deal keeps the government open. He told us late today he's made no commitments, but he's got open ears. Open ears and little time, Scott. I want to turn now to Hunter Biden. Uh, he just pleaded not guilty in federal tax charges in Los Angeles. But I want to ask you about the contempt proceedings um, in the House. What is the very latest, especially after Hunter Biden made that surprise appearance yesterday on Capitol Hill? There's a prospect, it may seem far-fetched for now, but the prospect of a different criminal case filed against Hunter Biden here in Washington, D.C. Yesterday, after Hunter Biden walked into the room at the House Oversight Committee, the Republicans in that committee passed a measure to recommend a contempt of Congress finding by the full U.S. House against Hunter Biden. The chairman of that committee, James Comer of Kentucky, told me today he expects the full House to vote and to pass that measure next week. If that happens, it's a formal recommendation from the U.S. House to the Department of Justice to criminally charge Biden with allegedly snubbing the congressional subpoena. He didn't answer on December 13th. Now, if that vote passes, is a big if. It's hard to tell what, if anything, can pass the U.S. House right now with that wafer-thin Republican majority, but also whether the Department of Justice takes up a prosecution of Hunter Biden is also quite a question, an open-ended one may require another special counsel to be appointed. So there's a long way between this day and any potential criminal prosecution for contempt of Congress, but Republicans are pushing for it and underscores the reality that would be a second prosecution of the president's son. And Scott, I want to make one more hard turn to Dr. Anthony Fauci. What can you tell us about his interview with a House subcommittee? Yeah, how about that? A 14-hour interview over two days by Dr. Fauci with a congressional subcommittee investigating the origins of COVID and the government's response to COVID. Members in the room told me it was cordial, that they covered a lot of ground, and they will now stage and schedule a public hearing before the cameras, before America, likely late this spring or early this summer, to have Dr. Fauci answer about what happened with COVID response and what the risks are moving forward. This is a priority of congressional Republicans. They want to raise the prospect and profile of Anthony Fauci as 2024 begins, and they want to talk about the pandemic response. We'll see what comes of that hearing, but that Anthony Fauci sat for 14 hours, hours tells you how much of a priority this is for this Congress. Absolutely. Scott McFarland, as always, thank you for your reporting. The White House is being pressed on Hunter Biden, who has pleaded not guilty to nine federal tax charges. CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins us now. Nancy, I can guess what the White House is saying about Hunter Biden's plea deal, uh, but tell us if they were asked about it and what their response is.
Oh, they were asked about it plenty this week, uh, Ouija, but you're right. Uh, so far, no comment, no comment, no comment is all we're getting. In the White House briefing, uh, the White House press secretary has been asked uh, about any number of things regarding Hunter Biden this week, including his surprise visit to Capitol Hill, his uh, court appearance today, and uh, her response is generally that Hunter Biden is a private citizen and we don't speak for him. And even when the questions are about uh, what the president thinks of choices Hunter Biden has made, that is the answer she gives. Now, interestingly, the first lady uh, did a sit-down interview with um, a television network, and she was asked about this, and she did answer. She said that she believes that the way Hunter Biden uh, ha has been treated by the House Oversight Committee is cruel, in her words, and she said she's especially concerned about how all of this is affecting her grandchildren, Hunter Biden's children. And those are very rare remarks from the first lady. Um, so they, you know, it matters because she has not really talked about, about this until now. Um, Nancy, I want to talk about inflation, too, because it ticked up this month. And you asked the director of the National Economic Council about rent and that impact on inflation. Can you walk us through that exchange? Sure. Inflation did tick up, but, um, but rent is still... Uh, rising quite a bit higher than the rate of inflation. And so that's what I asked her about in the White House briefing room, why that's happening and what her predictions are for next year. Take a listen. It looked like rent was one of the big drivers of uh, inflation. It was up 6.2 percent over the course of last year. What's your analysis about why uh, rent com continues to um, be a driver of inflation, twice as high as average inflation? And uh, what is your outlook for the next year? Rent affordability and housing affordability generally is an area uh, that really is salient for a lot of households as they sit around their kitchen tables paying their bills. Housing is a big one. We are very focused on housing affordability. Uh, we'd like to see uh, Congress uh, pass housing tax credits. Uh, but what she could not say is what she thinks will happen to rents um, and housing prices more generally if those housing tax credits are not passed. Ouija. And Nancy, I want to turn overseas because Iran seized an oil tanker in the Gulf of Oman that was at the center of a recent standoff with the U.S. Uh, what is the White House saying about that? Uh, well, they're speaking out very forcefully about this, Ouija, as you might imagine. Uh, the um, uh, NSC spokesperson, John Kirby, told us today that the Iranian government should immediately release that ship and its crew. Right now, the status of the crew is unknown. All we know is that Iranian uh, soldiers boarded the ship. They steered it towards Iran, and now uh, the status of the crewmates are, uh, is unknown. He said it's provocative and unacceptable. Um, and uh, the problem is that the White House is a little reluctant to go further than those words because they're wary of being drawn into conflict directly with Iran. Uh, they are also warning the Houthis that have also been uh, firing on commercial vessels in the Red Sea uh, that they could face consequences as well. Uh, they've been telegraphing the, the possibility that a U.S. strike on Yemen, on these Houthis, uh, is, is imminent. But uh, right now we're just watching and waiting to see what the U.S. does. The U.S. and a coalition of nations have argued these commercial vessels have nothing to do with the conflict. They're simply traversing through the region, Ouija. Uh, but what the Houthis have been arguing is that all of this is retaliation for Israeli strikes on, uh, on Hamas in Gaza. And Nancy, we haven't heard yet directly from President Biden about this. And today, during the briefing, the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, was pressed about uh, where he has been this week, because we haven't seen him at any official events. Uh, so what did they say about, you know, what the president is doing? What they said is that he was in four states over three days over the course of the weekend, um, giving speeches in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, in Charleston, South Carolina. He traveled to Texas, had a couple of um, days out, out of public view here at the White House, uh, though they did detail some of the meetings and calls that he has been engaged in. And then he's going to be giving a speech in Allentown, Pennsylvania, 
tomorrow. Uh, you're right. It is uh, rare for us to go several days like this without seeing him in person. Uh, but they continue to insist uh, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, he's simply conducting business behind closed doors. All right. Nancy Cordes, thank you as always. You're welcome. We are just four days away from the Iowa caucuses. We'll bring you to the Hawkeye State next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Donald Trump is the presumed frontrunner in the Iowa caucuses. The rest of the GOP field has just four days to close the gap. We're down to five Republican candidates vying for the nomination after Chris Christie dropped out yesterday. CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe joins us now. Ed, you know, I think I took for granted how often I see you because it feels like it's been forever. You've been in Iowa now for weeks and talking to voters. So tell me, what are they saying is their top issue as they head into the uh, election day? Uh, caucus day, I should say. Sorry. We should get to see you if, yes, caucus day. Let, let us not forget. They do it a little differently out here. Uh, good to see you, if only through a, uh, a two box. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we have spent most of our time here hearing uh, or putting an emphasis on hearing from, from these voters who play such an outsized role in beginning the 2024 campaign. Among the top issues, for Republican voters especially, uh, has been what is the future of border security? What does the future of immigration into the United States look like? Voters talk about it. So do the candidates. Take a listen. They pointed out that we're a thousand miles from the border. Like, why does that matter to us in Iowa? I'm like, are you kidding? These people are infiltrating everywhere. The immigration situation needs to be shut down. The borders need to be closed. Of course, the reality of uh, what the immigration situation is here, at least in Iowa, is a little different um, than, than as described by, by some who we've heard from. Uh, and we heard from uh, somebody who's lived in this state for nearly 30 years. Her name is Brenda Rodriguez. Uh, came to Iowa, came to the United States, like I said, about 30 years ago, uh, and explained to us why that is and why she chose to live in Iowa. But as an immigrant, how the conversation that she's been hearing from Republican candidates, from fellow Iowans who are participating in the caucuses, uh, has affected her uh, and other immigrants like her. We also talked to a guy named Joe Enrique Henry, who's a longtime immigrant rights activist, about this. So take a listen. We did it so many years being under the shadows, mm -hmm. and I'm done, you know. I had tried my best ways to go through the legal process, but it's no way. They don't leave any way for us. So when you hear these candidates who are running in your state talk about immigration and say that people who come illegally have to go home to wherever they're from, what do you think of that? I came like running from the father of my fa the, my daughters because I was scared of he killed me. I have worked a lot in this country. I think I haven't done anything wrong. I think I deserve a chance to stay. If I'm paying my taxes and I'm not doing anything, I don't think I'm a, a bad person that the people from Iowa don't want me here. Iowans, especially here, would have a very difficult time having anything to eat at dinner time without immigrants, because immigrants are the ones who process the meat, who uh, farm the fields, who uh, cook the food, serve the food. Uh, a lot of Iowans would starve without immigrants, taking care of all those necessary things to help feed those families. So, Weezer, that gives you some sense of how uh, those that maybe aren't as actively involved, but certainly who live and work here, uh, hear the conversation about that issue um, and then are, are living uh, their own reality, so to speak. Of course, there are so many other issues, Ed, that we heard about last night when Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis faced off in the final debate before the Iowa caucuses. They're crisscrossing the state, trying to get, you know, last-minute voters are they making any impact, or is this still mostly the Trump show in the Hawkeye State? 
that we have met nobody in this state, Lisa, who, who disputes the idea that the former president is ahead, but certainly Ron DeSantis's uh, operation uh, is confident they, they have built out uh, the kind of precinct by precinct, county by county campaign that is necessary to win in the very surgical way that the Iowa caucuses are, are conducted. Uh, Nikki Haley's team uh, is here. It was notable that she is here for the duration. There's no plan to go back to New Hampshire, for example, where she's suddenly cutting into the former president's lead, if you believe a recent poll. Uh, they're not as uh, well organized at that sort of very grassroots level uh, as much as the Trump and the DeSantis operations are. Uh, but they seem confident that some of the enthusiasm and maybe l late deciders who've been trying to decide between uh, Governor DeSantis and others uh, might, might break her way. He's here tonight. Uh, in Ames uh, at a barbecue joint that uh, has this great back room that we're in that's been used by candidates of both parties for several years to reach people in this community to the north of Des Moines. Um, and you're gonna see this really traditional retail campaigning across the state uh, through, through Sunday night into even Monday morning, uh, depending on the campaigns, whether it's DeSantis, the former president will be here at various points over the weekend. He's been relying on some of his Surrogates, uh, former Trump cabinet secretaries, members of his family are here tonight in the state. Uh, and then uh, Nikki Haley has her two uh, children who are in their 20s campaigning with her this weekend as well. Well, Ed, this mom who is concerned about seeing you on TV almost 24 hours a day hopes you eat, if not barbecue, something. Um, I want to talk about Chris Christie because he dropped out of the presidential race last night, as you know. And I wonder if that's going to make any campaigns, because there are five remaining uh, candidates vying for the GOP nomination. Is Christie's absence going to help anybody? Not here in Iowa. He's been a complete non-factor. Never organized, <laughs> uh, did not visit, certainly over the last several months as he was so laser focused on campaigning in New Hampshire and spending time in New York and Washington television studios trying to take advantage of free earned media. So uh, it, it really is down to these five, as you see them on screen, and arguably more so the first three there, uh, Trump, DeSantis, and Haley. Um, the big question is what happens to his support up in New Hampshire, where uh, looking at surveys that were released in the last two weeks, you could see sort of, okay, if he's your first choice, who's your second choice? Most of the data suggests that most of his support does have the potential to transfer over to Governor Haley, Ambassador Haley. But we've also heard in the last 24 hours where we've been reminded of the real bad blood between these two rival camps and his concerns that she doesn't have what it takes potentially to take on the former president and at least beat him in New Hampshire, if not defeat him outright. Yes, Ed, that was made very clear. As always, thank you for joining us and for all of your reporting. And a quick programming note, on Sunday, CBS News' Margaret Brennan will preview the Iowa caucuses at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern. And on Monday, January 15th, join us all day long for up-to-the-minute coverage of the Iowa caucuses right here on CBS News. Governor DeSantis is betting big on Iowa to give his campaign the momentum it needs to secure the Republican nomination. His campaign manager joins us next to address the GOP field and DeSantis. DeSantis's path to victory. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Despite both trying to catch up to Donald Trump in the polls, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis spent most of last night's debate going after each other. Joining me now is DeSantis campaign manager James Uthmeyer. James, it's great to see you. I want to start with Chris Christie dropping out of the race and what that could mean for your campaign. Last night on a hot mic, we all heard it. Christie said that Governor DeSantis called him petrified. What did he mean by that? Well, well, listen, uh, the, the governor and, and 
uh, Chris Christie. They've, they've had conversations over the past weeks. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to divulge the confidences of those, uh, but I can tell you, I think the governor said it best last night. Uh, he's a veteran. He's fought in Fallujah. Uh, the, the concept of being petrified, that's just ridiculous. So uh, I think that was a little bit of hot air. I do think the first half of what Chris Christie said on that hot mic was a little more accurate, which is Nikki Haley is going to get smoked. And uh, we saw that happen firsthand last night. How often do, does, uh, do these two men talk to each other? Uh, yeah, you, you'd have to ask them. I'm, I'm not able to, to comment on that one, unfortunately. Okay, so can you tell me whether uh, Governor DeSantis has explicitly asked for Christie's endorsement now that he's not running? Uh, I, I don't believe he has. Um, you know, Chris Christie, he, he gets a lot of Democrats that support him, and uh, Ron DeSantis is a conservative. Uh, he's the only guy that can actually unite the party. Uh, he can connect both uh, people that support Trump, that like the way things were under a Trump administration, but also people that are ready to move on, that are looking forward, uh, that want to see a leader, unlike President Trump, who can actually cut the deficit, who's not going to add $8 trillion to the deficit, somebody that's going to fight for freedom to keep our country open, uh, somebody that's going to secure record-setting tax relief for American families, much like the governor did in Florida. Uh, he secured billions in tax relief by cutting gas taxes, taxes on baby clothing, diapers, tolls, you name it. Uh, the people of Florida have never been better off economically uh, than they are right now. And what a great thing it would be to take that vision, that proven record, to D.C. And, and change the lives of Americans. I'm glad you brought up the former, gov uh, former president because I, I wonder for our audience if you could draw a contrast between uh, DeSantis and Trump. Because while we've heard a couple of lines on the trail, um, I, you know, I'm struggling to see how you're trying to paint this very different picture of two candidates. So how are they different? Sure. Well, look, if, if you're at home now and, you know, you're seeing your, your mortgage payment now is twice what it was five, six years ago, uh, prices at the pump have gone up, uh, and inflation is hurting people and their checkbooks, groceries, uh, basic household products, everything's going up. Uh, you need a sure thing. You need somebody that's put their money where their mouth is. They're not just full of hot air. It's not just the talk. It's not empty promises. It's somebody with a proven track record of results. And unfortunately, a lot of the former president's promises, he just didn't deliver on them. Um, we don't have a wall. Uh, the invasion at the southern border is worse than it's ever been. Uh, he added almost $8 trillion to the national deficit, more than any president prior to him, including Barack Obama. Uh, and he did shut down the government. He did sign a CARES Act that led to millions of dollars towards absentee ballots during COVID, which ultimately led to ballot harvesting and jeopardized the integrity of our election system. Uh, so there are a lot of questions, a lot of open ends out there that, that people are concerned about. Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, he has delivered on 100 percent of his promises and then some. Everything from record school choice, the first state, to fully fund universal school choice for every kid in the state, record-setting tax relief, record-setting infrastructure, number one K-12 and university system education in the country. Florida is where it's at because of Governor DeSantis and his policies. And as your president, he will take that same hard work ethic, uh, that same strategy, that same day-to-day -day operation to D.C. He will find a way to work with Congress. He will be fiscally constrained. Uh, he will gut the federal government. He will get agencies out of there. He will fire bureaucrats. He will put more money in your pocket. So that's the big difference. He's a guy that's proven he can win. He can beat the left in the big fights. Uh, he can bring back fiscal responsibility, and he will help you at home. I hear what you're saying, and he is still trailing the former president, though, in the polls. And um, I know. Well, I, I don't know that you can be trailing when nobody's cast a vote yet. Um, there's no winning and losing until the voters go. I know there's a lot of polls that come out, and they're wide ranging, uh, uh, but I'll tell you that the real results are when the voters at home actually cast their votes. And I want to ask you about results and what a victory would mean to you. How do you define success in Iowa in just a few days? 
Well, we're going to do a great job. Uh, I think we've got a great shot in this state. Um, we've got the largest operation. Uh, it's pretty cold here, temperatures in the teens, and it looks like next week that's only going to go down. Uh, but when it's 10 below and there's lots of snow, uh, we're ready to go. We've got people in every county. We've got precinct captains across the state. We've got a vast network of people that are working through the Rolodex. They're calling their friends. They're calling their family. They're calling their neighbors. Uh, and, and it's really a get-out-the-vote operation. It's a small state. The caucus system is a, a historic thing with a lot of tradition where you've got to go out there, you've got to put in some work, and it's the voters that are really convicted, that have a lot of passion behind their, their drive for their candidate, their drive for their vision for the future of this country, uh, that go out and make a big difference. And that big difference is going to be for Ron DeSantis. But James, is winning, does doing great mean beating Trump, or does it mean beating Haley, coming in second? Well, listen, I, I don't think this is a must-win state. I think we've got a really good shot. But, look, the media's written us off for dead. They've written Ron DeSantis' obituary. Uh, the projections range from losing by 30, 40 points. And I'll just say this. I think there's going to be some big surprises next Monday, and uh, we're going to be celebrating. All right, James. We hope to talk to you then. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Former President Donald Trump spent time in the courtroom and not on the campaign trail today. We'll explain his strategy heading into the Iowa caucuses. You're streaming America Decides. We are just four days out from the Iowa caucuses. And today, former President Donald Trump spent the day in court, attending closing arguments in his civil fraud trial. He holds a commanding lead in the Hawkeye state, according to recent polls. CBS News political correspondent Caitlin Huey Burns joins us now. Caitlin, it's so great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks, Weed. Uh, so, this is not the first time we've talked about Trump in mm -hmm. court facing charges, in yeah. this case, uh, a civil uh, fraud case. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder whether the impact has changed at all over time, mm -hmm. because there was a mm -hmm. point where he was saying, this is actually going to help me. Mm -hmm. Is that so true? Yeah, and uh, he told Robert Costa today that he plans to be at all of his trials. Um, what's interesting is that this very much, as we've talked about, is is the campaign. And for practical reasons, because he's going to be in court a lot, and also for kind of philosophical reasons, he's been kind of campaigning as the target of investigations and what he calls unfair moves by the Justice Department. Um, and it's really fed into his supporters as well. And what's happened is he's gotten a lot of attention for it as well without facing much political consequence, especially in a place like Iowa. Um, he's been able to go in, have a rally, come back, go to New York or D.C., appear in front of a trial. When he appears um, at these trials, he gets wall-to-wall -wall coverage of it. Um, and he, you know, as we saw in the debate last night, he doesn't really miss out right. by not participating in those kinds of things. And his base of support just views that kind of campaigning differently than they do from a DeSantis or a Haley. As you mentioned, he continues to avoid the debate stage. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder whether you think that strategy is a winning one because yeah. he's not chiming in. He's not defending mm -hmm. himself in real time from other yeah. uh, hopeful candidates. Yeah, I think when we look at the success that Trump has had so far, and again, nobody has voted yet, nobody has caucused yet, uh, but if you're kind of looking at how he's been able to maintain this lead in the polls, um, it turns out to have been a pretty smart strategy just from a purely political standpoint not to participate in the debates because, as we've seen, the debates have really, in his absence, been kind of an undercard debate. They've attacked each other. They really haven't gone hard after Trump. I mean, we really saw that in the debate last night between uh, mm -hmm. DeSantis and Haley. They were going after each other, barely talking about the front runner in this race. And they've all kind of admitted that this is a race for second place in places like Iowa and New Hampshire. So why do they care about second place so much? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of wild, and it was wild watching the debate that this is all for really a hope for a second-place finish mm -hmm. uh, for DeSantis in Iowa or Haley in New Hampshire. Um, they could certainly defeat expectations. We've seen that in races before, uh, but not with this kind of polling lead that the former president has and also with uh, his grasp on Republican and caucus goers, um, mm -hmm. primary and caucus goers. Um, but what I think, you know, is they're trying to do, talking to the campaigns, is present themselves as the Trump alternative. Um, but in doing so, they haven't really articulated 
um, at least what we've seen, of how they would be all that different from Trump. I mean, Haley talks about uh, leaving the chaos behind. Um, Ron DeSantis, uh, you know, has, as you talked to his campaign manager, outlined. Um, but they have been, you know, hesitant to really take him on in the same way that they're taking on each other. Well, I think this close to the Iowa caucuses, that is surprising, mm -hmm. right? Or do they just don't think they can change any Trump voters their way? Yeah. Why do you think that they are so hesitant to calling him out? Yeah, it's a really delicate balance that they've been trying to strike. They don't want to turn away Trump supporters. You could argue that Trump supporters aren't going to migrate anywhere else anyway. Um, but they, you know, if you want to, you know, they've been trying to kind of thread this needle between um, supporting Trump and his policies, but wanting to appeal to those who may want to turn the page. And there are a lot of voters in the Republican Party that we've talked to that are, that do have that appetite of turning the page. But I keep pointing to uh, their responses to these Trump trials. At every turn, they've come to his defense, at, at every indictment. And it's really given, you know, an excuse for voters to also feel the same way. You know, if they're not going after Trump, why should a voter? Um, and I think that's what we're seeing, at least in the polls at this point. Again, no one has voted, but that's what we've seen, um, at least as the overarching theme in this race. And speaking of turning the page, you know, we've seen so much emphasis on Iowa, 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 but mm -hmm. New Hampshire is right there. Yeah. Do you think that these campaigns have placed too much emphasis on Iowa and not enough on New Hampshire? It's interesting because as you and I talked about and, and as you know from covering these campaigns, Iowa is not the picker of presidents, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, just two, I think, since 1980 in the Republican sphere have been gone on to win the nomination. Um, New Hampshire has been much more indicative of the eventual nominee. Um, but Iowa has been the place where um, these candidates seeking to be the alternative, namely DeSantis, have been trying to appeal. But it's also a very small voter set. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think under 200,000 voters are likely to participate in the primary, far, you know, uh, in the caucus, far less. Uh, so there is this question of why not a focus on New Hampshire. That's what Haley is certainly trying to do. And when you look at Christie uh, dropping out of the race, um, there is some hope on Haley's part that she could potentially attract some of his voters. Um, but the question is, does anybody want the Christie mm -hmm. endorsement? He doesn't seem willing to give it to anybody, and nobody really seems to want it, given right. how critical he's been of Trump. And, you know, going back to Iowa, because we're going to be there physically in just four yeah. days, um, I wonder if you expect any other candidates to drop out, depending on what unfolds there. Well, it will be difficult for DeSantis to make the case unless he, um, you know, does well there. I mean, his team has described a 10-point differential between himself and Trump as success there. Um, if Nikki Haley is close to him, uh, that's a different story. So we'll see what kind of momentum he can seize from Iowa. He's not as competitive in New Hampshire as Haley is. Yeah. Well, we will see in just a few days. Yes, we will. Kaylin Huey-Burns, thank you so much. That does it for us today. You are streaming CBS News.